As Lord Mayor of Dublin, it brings me great pride to be here to launch this exhibition alongside Antonis de Leovraca. We are all involved in history making through our actions, the stories we tell and the objects we keep and pass on as well. And the signatories of the treaty 100 years ago were acutely aware of this, of course, as were Hazel and John Lavery as well. The Laveries and their studio played a central role in the treaty negotiations. As Oliver St. John Gogarty commented, at Five Cromwell Place, men could meet as humans beyond the scent of herded wolves. The artworks and objects in studio and in state tell the story of a unique intersection between politics and painting. We see the brushstrokes applied in sittings that took place in precious moments between meetings, documenting a pivotal moment in Irish and British history. Studio and State provides us with a contemporary lens through which to reflect on these personalities, their courage, their wiliness, ambition, determination, and also their humanity, and as well as the momentous events that occurred and which shaped the birth of modern Ireland. It's said that great art illuminates our lives. It helps us to make sense of who we are and the world that we live in. This exhibition shows how great art also helps to illuminate the past. John Lavery was a remarkable artist. Orphaned as a young boy, he rose from poverty to become one of the most celebrated artists of the day. In this exhibition, we also see the artifacts of this pivotal time in Irish history the pens that signed for peace, the paper that gave Ireland the promise of independence and a better future. The treaty was a stepping stone to freedom and the artworks and artifacts in this exhibition show us how that stepping stone was put in place. So John Lavery was born in, in Belfast, um, but was, was orphaned at a fairly early age and actually grew up in, uh, in the southwest of, of Scotland. And he began his artistic career actually in Glasgow. Um, that's where he began tr his training, but he also studied in France and was uh, part of a group known as the Glasgow Boys who were bringing back ideas from France about kind of modern painting and painting in the open air. And um, so it was a very dynamic city culturally at the time and that's where he got his start and he was commissioned to paint uh, the visit of Queen Victoria to the Glasgow exhibition in, in 1888 and that really kind of launched his career, that, um, that royal commission. A few years later he moved to London and he established himself as one of the leading portrait painters of the day, although he also is best known for his portraits but he also painted landscapes and other subjects as well. They actually met when she was um, studying art and when she was in France uh, in the early 1900s. And she said later on, when they had married in 1909, and she said, um, one artist in the family is enough. I think they worked very well together as a kind of a couple in terms of man her managing the studio. And, and that's part of the story we t tell through the exhibition. But it was Hazel really who encouraged him to kind of look, look to his Irish roots and to paint Irish subject pictures. and. They became, I think from about 1916 onwards, increasingly interested in, in Irish affairs. Um, so she didn't pursue her career, artistic career professionally, but um, she always kept it up and she always painted at home. So it's wonderful that we have at least one of her um, works here in the exhibition, the portrait of John. The painting of John was painted in 1921 by Hazel in the same period as he was painting you know, Arthur Griffith and, and Michael Collins and, and uh, all of the politicians who were there in, in London for the treaty negotiations. Exactly at the same time as the treaty negotiations, John and Hazel held a joint exhibition um, at, at the Alpine Club galleries and it was well received. There's, a, there's sometimes a little bit of slightly um, patronising, I think, or slightly uh, because of her gender, uh, in the way the reviews are, it's a sort of a surprise that she might be so good. She was really an early influencer, if you like, and if you speak in our language today. She was a celebrity, really, uh, also in the fashion world as well, um, pictured in Vogue and different magazines at the time. And the couple, both John and Hazel Avery, were quite often 
uh, pictures in magazines or journals at the time. I mean, very different in terms of artistic work, but if you think of someone maybe like Tracy Emin or Damien Hirst, in, in terms of having a kind of a public recognition, a, a public name awareness, even outside the arts, I think the libraries were right up there. She would have often staged these events called Tableau Vivant, these fundraising events where they would kind of stage paintings, and so she was quite celebrated as a, as a kind of great beauty and as a great kind of society uh, hostess. Um, and then, of course, in Ireland, much later, several years after this, uh, Lavery was commissioned to uh, create an image for the, for the new banknotes uh, in, the, in the 1920s, and he used a Hazel's image. Um, so she had this kind of, even after her death, then, this, this in, enduring image of Hazel on the Irish banknotes for many decades, and then even on the watermark when, when, when it was changed. So uh, she's, I think, familiar to an awful lot of people. Um, even if they maybe didn't know her name, you know, she, uh, she had this kind of enduring legacy. He was connected, especially in liberal circles. Winston Churchill was a family friend of the Laveries, of both Hazel and uh, John Lavery. The Laveries and the Churchills, in fact, were uh, close friends, regularly visited each other, went on uh, trips together. Winston Churchill was a keen amateur painter and would go painting with John and Hazel and, and they both kind of taught him, you know, to, to paint. Um, and actually the, the painting we have here was uh, slightly earlier, so he included it in the gift to Dublin in 1935, but actually it was painted in 1915. So Five Cromwell Place was really kind of centrally located um, in South Kensington. It was very near actually where the Irish delegation was staying uh, in Hans Place and Michael Collins stayed at another location. Lavery invited the delegates to come and sit for their portraits, both the British and Irish delegates, and um, most of them did. Um, and so they would come and he allocated around three hours for each portrait um, for them to sit. He was a very skilled um, painter, and so you get this, uh, yeah, this, this facility about working quickly. And I think that was needed when he was you know, doing these portraits of politicians, because they had you know, fairly short um, free time to come to the studio and you'd need to work quite quickly. John Lavery's focus was for, first and foremost to record history, to record this important event and they were quite aware that this was import an important time. They cancelled their holiday plans that they had and stayed at home in London. So Lavery had been encouraged by Hazel to paint Irish po political subjects and she saw it as a means of maybe bringing people together through art. Um, and in 1921, he really had a clear uh, vision from the outset that this was going to be a kind of a pivotal year and he wanted to record this in paint. He wanted uh, to record the, the treaty negotiations. And I think his first idea was, in fact, to paint a grand history painting with all the signatories seated around a table. That didn't transpire. Um, but he managed to get all of the signatories pretty much to sit for him. Some of the other paintings we loaned from the Ulster Museum, that of the royal family, and uh, one of Lady Lavery, and also the um, painting from the National Gallery of the ratification of the treaty. We have quite a good selection of paper-based documents, historical documents in the National Museum. I guess we wanted to tell the story both through the paintings and the art artefacts. The paintings, um, I guess, give a great kind of visual sense of, of who was present, who the players were, um, and, but we wanted to show the kind of context for that, that uh, these um, negotiations were taking place uh, at a very, uh, anyway, very tense you know, period. We wanted to show a little bit of the, through the photography, the social context, uh, some of the debates through the documents, the pro and treaty uh, pamphlets. Raymond de Valera um, went in July in the summer of 1921 and his portrait is on display here. The de Valera painting um, is, is, you see, very kind of uh, fluid and quickly made brush marks, which gives it, I think, great energy uh, in particular. But Lavery wanted actually to revisit it. He wasn't that happy with it and wanted another sitting to do another painting, but that never, that never happened. And in terms of the composition, de Valera is seated, not looking at the viewer or at the painter. I think perhaps there's something about just trying to get the sitter comfortable. So they're just seated in a pose that, uh, you know, that, that makes them comfortable and relaxed to, to kind of, so he can work away and capture the painting. 
Um, you see quite a different one, see, in Birkenhead, who's in his, his court dress and he's very much addressing the, the viewer. Apart from sitting, formally sitting for the portrait, there was also uh, lunches and dinners going on, so conversations between Irish and British delegates in, the, in their home. I think probably these informal encounters in the studio, you know, helped kind of, uh, kind of grease the, the diplomatic machinery, if you like. Yeah. The portrait of Hazel that we have on display here is uh, her and her daughter, Alice, and that's her daughter from a, from a previous marriage, and, and John had a daughter, Eileen, from a previous marriage as well. So It was painted in 1909, not long after her mother's death, so it's, it's very likely that she was still in mourning for her mother's death. So she's dressed in dark clothes. I think the first painting of Hazel and Alice together, so this is kind of the, the, the arrival of his new family that he was sort of documenting. And when it was shown, I think there was a little bit of, you know, who is this woman? Who, you know, what's the relationship there? It's kind of heralding their arrival into London society. One of the most interesting things are the propaganda leaflets, I think, because they're so current in many ways. You get the anti and pro treaty side after the signing of the treaty. The pro treaty side lists quite comprehensively what the advantages, of course, are of, of the of the treaty, and of voting for the treaty and the politicians that support it. And one line that we used for the marketing as well of the exhibition: um, "Do you want to be free?" I think a very current and probably will remain current um, question in. Uh, in today's times as well. So um, just to see how they fought over, with quite harsh language sometimes, um, over this political document and over this political decision that would affect so many generations after them. I think it's fascinating the, uh, the, the gaming table, the, sheet, the, the, the roulette game. I think often, you know, we, when we're talking about, say, tr things like treaty negotiations, it's, it's all about the, the, the political um, machinations and the, the, the policy points and the points of argument but then you look at this and you kind of see that these were you know humans who um, who you know had to have time off and had to have you know a break from all the pressures of this and uh, a bit of fun and things like the pen that Michael Collins used and the typewriter that they used I think you, you get very close um, physically to a sense of them and the, 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 the people this isn't just a kind of a document, you know, that's in an archive, it's, it's um, these are kind of people uh, with all the pressures that they faced, you know, trying to kind of negotiate a, a future. Um, and I, I think that's what I love about the exhibition, that you get that kind of human side of the story. We have a letter by Collins that was written in December, um, just after signing the treaty, um, that he thinks um, the removal of the um, of the army of the British army is a supreme thing, so that he is sort of standing by what he signed and looking forward to to what will come from that. And even as a historical document, that that letter was in a very worn stage. And so to get that back to display level, you know, so and see the handwriting and see also how his signature was actually overwritten on the letter. Um, and Griffith, Arthur Griffith, issued a note. And he had crossed out hope and replaced it with believe. So sort of determination to go and run with what they had negotiated and signed and to stand by it. And the pressure, the immense pressure, all of them must have been under in, in those months and afterwards indeed as well. Um, that comes through um, in those personal documents quite, quite well, I think. Lavery said that he wasn't able to get Lloyd George to a sitting in 1921-1922. Uh, he, he painted him much later on, actually in the 1930s, after Lloyd George had retired. He, he visited um, Lloyd George's home and uh, again, he's someone that Lavery had a lot of respect for. He talks about him in his autobiography as being one of the most uh, important kind of statesmen that he'd met, that he had a lot of respect for him. And Lloyd George had actually knighted him in, for his services as a, as a war artist. So there's a, a kind of a long relationship there, but he couldn't get him to sit in 1921. I guess you know, he was prime minister, he was <laughs> pretty busy. Um, and so we think actually, and, and Kenneth McConkie, another art historian, suggested this, that this was actually painted from a photograph. So yeah, it is, it is direct, it is straight on, um, with a fully lit 
face, which kind of looks a little bit like a studio photograph. So I think that's a, I think that's a fair assumption. Uh, but he did paint it in 1922, you know, at the same time as the other works. Birkenhead um, said after signing it, um, uh, I might have signed my political death warrant, warrant and Collins actually said um, I, I probably signed my, my actual death warrant, warrant by signing the treaty. So um, we have the pen that Michael Collins used in, in 1921 to sign the treaty. Um, it's reputedly the pen that he used. We have it in the collection on display here, and it was donated by a descendant of, um, of Robert Farnan, who, who was a close friend of de Valera's actually, but also uh, knew Michael Collins quite well and the politicians at the time, and he had uh, offered his house, his home in Dublin, as a safe house during the War of Independence. So Collins had hid in the house. So Lavery did paint Collins in, in, in 1921 when he was in London for the treaty negotiations um, and actually Collins wrote that he found it a kind of a torturous experience, he didn't really enjoy sitting still, uh, but that painting after Collins died was given to Kitty Kiernan and uh, so the original is, is lost as far as we know, we don't know where that is today, although it was reproduced in 1922 as a lithograph. Um, the portraits of Collins and of Griffith were, were um, published as an edition, a fundraising edition for, for Sinn Féin. In 1935, when he gave the group to Dublin, uh, he painted a replacement painting. He wanted Collins to be part of that treaty group, and so he painted a, a, a kind of posthumous portrait of Collins to, to give to the city. Lavery had wanted initially to do this kind of big history painting of the signing of the treaty and that didn't happen, um, but he did paint the passage of the legislation through the House of Lords in December 1921 and he spent four days there painting in situ and was the first artist to be even given the right to paint while the House was sitting, in fact. And he, the painting we have from the National Gallery of Ireland is one of the little sketches that he did sitting in the, in the House of Lords up in the up in the gallery uh, looking down on the scene and he worked it up into a much bigger composition and the final painting is now in Glasgow uh, but he so he did capture this kind of historical moment as the as the treaty was ratified which of these is my favorite painting it's a tough question um, uh, I love actually the um, the painting of Chamberlain which is the unfinished painting which is a little bit it's a bit of a mystery as to why he was, uh, it was unfinished because Chamberlain and the Lavery's would have mixed in the same circle so you would have thought he would have had access to a, another sitting. Um, I think it's fascinating because you see the way Lavery worked and you see him, uh, his skill as a painter in just building up very quickly the, the kind of form of the face and the flesh tones. So it's much less worked than, um, than the other works. Uh, it's just the, really the face that he, he got to. Um, I'm quite fond of the Barton painting, I don't know, uh, maybe it's a little more kind of introspective, he's, he's kind of reading this document. Um, uh, it's quite a sensitive painting, I think. Um, and, uh, but of course the painting of, of Hazel and of Alice is, is really quite stunning. Um, and I think for many visitors that, that's one that, that they're really drawn to. Um, and you have these two faces that kind of emerge from the darkness, but actually within that, if you look closely, there's an awful lot of subtlety in, in terms of the way, the way Lavery's painted it. Um, we also um, put together um, a book, an exhibition catalogue that lists all the objects that are here, so you can read in detail at home about the historical context and lab the Lavery's as well. But I think here in the exhibition you see the original, and I don't think um, that comes across if you see it in a film or if you if you um, only read the books. Studio and State gives, uh, I think, a great uh, understanding of both the, the treaty negotiations, the story of the treaty during 1921, um, but also it's really kind of unique and not just showing maybe some of the historical documents, but showing it through paintings and throw, showing this unique story of how the artist kind of inserted himself into this political moment and uh, both documenting it, but also kind of opening up the studio as a space for, for negotiation. If you see the signatories um, close up face to face as you stand in front of the portraits, it obviously gives it a different um, 
perspective or different angle it humanizes the story. Also the handwritten notes I think that we took out from the museum collection are quite, bring us a little bit closer to the figures 100 years ago. We also added uh, British party film material as well, original newsreel footage from the time that you can see in, in the exhibition space, which adds another level again and brings it more to life again with the moving image. This is something I actually love about, I guess, about art and about painting, is that you, you get a sense of, when you're looking at a painting, you're standing where John Avery stood when he was painting it. So there's that kind of, um, yeah, that physical sense of history, that, that there's this kind of connection made um, through the paintings and through, some, you know, through the objects that um, you don't get from reading a book or from you know, looking at something online. You kind of have to see it in the space and uh, experience it. It's free. It's open every day of the week and it's free and it's a wonderful thing. We have in Ireland that we have um, free museums and exhibitions and this is the same with studio and stage where you can just wander in and browse and read and come back again um, any day of the week.